Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Cancer Education Series. I'm Dick Deming. I'm Medical Director of Mercy One Cancer Center and the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Our Cancer Education Series is brought to you as a collaboration from Mercy One Cancer Center and Above and Beyond Cancer, and it is brought to you, uh, sponsored in part, by a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. And I want to welcome Jay Heverlow tonight. So Jay is a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine. We're going to learn what that's all about and also the role that acupuncture and Chinese medicine can play in cancer care. So welcome, Jay. Thank you. Happy so, to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you. Tell me a little okay. bit about yourself. Um, so where did you grow up? I grew up here in Norwalk um, in Iowa. So uh, 1990, finished high school. I uh, left for the service, joined the service, traveled the world a bit. Great. Thank uh, you for your service. Thank you. And thank you for yours. <laughs> well, we, were, we were chatting a little bit before. So Jay was in the Air Force. I was a Navy doc. Uh, yeah. And uh, your Air Force experience, you got some international travel with that. I did. I was uh, I was in Europe. I was in the Middle East and then California and around the States a little bit. So, yeah. Okay. And I think you told me you spent four years there and yep. then... Well, uh, went to California <laughs> <laughs> to pursue some dreams. I did, yeah. Uh -huh. So I ended up in San Francisco, uh, got out of the service there, and studied music for a couple of years there, about three or four years, um, and then found my way to Chinese medicine through that. So yeah. yeah, and you were telling me that maybe your first exposure to Chinese medicine was as a patient. Correct. Yeah, I had uh, I had a back injury playing some golf, and I'm not a golfer, so I. Uh, had an acute sciatic problem. And it was pretty severe. It took me out of work for a couple months. And the only relief I found was, was going to the Chinese medicine school to get acupuncture. And I thought, you know, instead of looking for a gig every weekend, I might want to go back to school. Yeah. And when you're living in the San Francisco area, mm -hmm. finding an acupuncture specialist is not difficult. Oh, there's plenty of them. Yeah. yeah. There's a, you know, you have Chinatown there, you have the whole Bay Area. There's four colleges there. So yeah, quite a few students and quite a few practitioners. So maybe uh, tell me just a little bit about your first experience as a patient mm. with acupuncture. What, what were your um, expectations going in? What were your um, maybe uh, reservations? And uh, how, how was that first interaction? Yeah, you know, I, I went in on a, on a recommendation of a friend. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, and, you know, I went in and the student did the intake. It was just me and the student, the third year student. So we went through all the categories of, that we go through. And I didn't know what, he seemed to be asking me a lot of questions. And, uh, and then the doctor came in, a Chinese fellow, and he did his intake and did his uh, diagnosis. And then they did the treatment. I didn't think it was too bad. You know, I didn't feel any pain. The needles were fine. And then afterwards, they brought out two bags of herbs uh, to help treat the condition as well. And that was kind of strange because there were all these strange herbs in these bags. And I had to get the special pot and I had to go home and cook them and drink them. And, uh, you know, I went back quite a few times and it just kept getting better and it kept getting better. And I thought, there's something to this, you know. So it was interesting. And then at what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to pursue it yeah. as a profession? Um, it wasn't, it was shortly after that. I think after I got better, I kind of got back to work. I was doing good. Uh, I'd already studied, studying the Chinese language. So I had uh, an experience with the language and started uh, studying Chinese philosophy. So the philosophy kind of led me to it. And then Chinese medicine, I started looking into it and, the foundations of it is so culturally deep over there. Uh, it's it's tied in with with everything. You know, it's been going on for five thousand years. So, the poetry, the music, the the medicine, it's all tied together. The martial arts, it's everything. Uh, it's a way of life, really. And so, I was really intrigued by it. And the whole foundation of it is that uh, it's about living in harmony with nature. So, I think if you start your foundation with that, that's that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that seems like a really good place to go. So so tell me a little bit about your education. What's the education process to get to a doctor of acupuncture in Chinese medicine? Yeah, you have to. Uh, so you have an undergrad for your undergraduate. And usually most people do theirs with their science prereqs, like biology, anatomy, physiology, chemistry, all your Western core courses. So uh, for your undergraduate in science. And then you go to 
uh, a master's program from there. And when I started going to school, that's all they had was master level program. So you would spend, it's a four year program, but you can do the accelerated. Uh, you do your clinical internships, you know, during that program. So you're in the clinic for three years of that, seeing patients. Um, and now they have doctorate programs. So as I got out, I was able to pursue, I opened my clinic first, and then they came out with doctorate programs and I was able to get my doctorate after that through uh, school in San Diego. So, so back to your um, initial, your college and your master's, at what point do you get uh, into the Chinese philosophies of, you know, Confucius and Lao Tzu and, mm. and uh, the Tao Te Ching and where, where is that in the undergrad? Is that in the graduate it's program? It's in the graduate program, yeah. Oh. So in the undergraduate program, I personally got into it. It was the Tao Te Ching, it was Lao Tzu. Um, those those books intrigued me and really drew me to it. So when I got into graduate school, it's nice to see that those were part of the curriculum. You know, you were doing Tai Chi as part of your curriculum. You were doing um, Chinese medical massage, which is Tui Na. You were studying uh, uh, things like the Tao Te Ching, right? So it was pretty amazing. And then um, obviously you learn the science and the, the technique mm. of uh, both acupuncture and herbs. And right. uh, so before we talk about the individual uh, practices, what would be some of the other uh, types of treatments besides acupuncture and herbal therapy that you would classify as Chinese medicine? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So what is Chinese medicine? A lot of yes. people will hear, what is, you know, what is it? So you can kind of, um, you understand what the, what the techniques are that we use, and then you understand what the lifestyle of it is. So some of the techniques we use are acupuncture, cupping, scraping, uh, which is gua sha tool, um, tui na, which is Chinese medical massage. We do uh, Yijin Jing, which is like maybe physical therapy exercises, Tai Chi, uh, Qigong meditation, um, food therapy we do. Um, what else do we do? Herbal therapy, uh, lifestyle counseling. So all of these put together um, treat a wide variety. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole healthcare system, you know, that's been around for 5,000 years. So they, the the doctors in the past three, 4,000 years have been writing books on all the conditions, you know, that they've seen and the extent of what they can treat is, is really amazing, you know. So when uh, someone comes to see you, what sort of an intake do you do? Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a Western trained doctor, we do the history and physical examination. Yeah. The history is obviously the history of their medical condition, but then the past medical history and et cetera, what, what, what's sort of the format by which yeah. you do your initial intake? So this, this has been developed, if you go back and read, you know, the history of Chinese medicine, this has been developed over thousands of years. So they keep adding on to it. Um, and that's the thing about Chinese medicine is the reason I practice 3000 years later in Iowa is because it still applies. The human body hasn't changed. The things that they're treating haven't changed. It's the way disease manifests in the body. So they go through, uh, the four major pillars are looking, listening, smelling, and palpation, right? So we go uh, looking as you observe the patient. One of the things that Chinese medicine is amazing at is understanding the microcosm within the macrocosm, right? So the idea is that what happens outside of us also happens inside of us, right? So inside we have our own universe, our own weather that's happening, and it's connected to the outside, right? So looking at a patient, they can see the interconnectivity of something. Um, when I see something about a patient appearing on their face, I can tell which organ systems are in relation, right? So if you have a patient coming in with a rash around this area, maybe stomach problems, right? Or if they have um, eczema here, maybe lung problems, right? Or ear problems uh, might be connected to the kidneys. So there's this, this looking that you can already start diagnosing, right? They say in Chinese medicine that a proficient doctor has them, a patient 90% diagnosed from the front door to their desk because you can start to chip away at your diagnosis before they even get to you, right? So you have looking, you have listening is the interrogation part, right? You're asking questions. You go through 14 different categories. You're going through body temperatures, taste sensations, bowel movements, excretions, sleep, emotions, pain, all of these categories, right? 
And we break all those down. And then you have palpation, and this is where you're palpating the channels of the body, right? So the acupuncture channels, there's 14 major channels where the acupuncture points are. We have 72 internal pathways we, that we work with. So you might palpate, you know, the pain area. You may palpate the organ systems. You may palpate the hands, the feet uh, to help further your diagnosis. And then the last one is smelling. So a patient might have a certain uh, smell to them, and that means uh, certain things in our medicine, right? That leads us to certain diagnosis. To understand what we're diagnosing is um, patterns. We're looking at patterns, right? So this means the collection of all this information, we also look at tongue and pulse, right? Those are all part of looking and palpation. So we, and you said tongue yeah. and pulse? Yeah. yeah, so the tongue is a map to the interior, right? So if you Google Chinese tongue diagnosis, you'll see the map that we use. And different parts of the tongue relate to different organ systems. So the tip relates to the heart, the space behind that relates to the lungs, with the sides of the gallbladder and the spleen. Um, I'm sorry, stomach and spleen in the middle is um, liver, gallbladder, back is kidney. So we look at what's happening on the tongue. Then we look at the pulses. There's 27 different pulse types that we have, and you can have combinations of pulses. So we can tell the organ systems through the pulse. So you put all these symptoms together and you start to see patterns evolving. These patterns will dictate what imbalances are in which organ systems, right? And that will lead you to your diagnosis, which will lead you to your treatment principles and so forth. And are the, the names of the diagnoses, do they correspond to Western diagnoses or do they uh, have yeah. different? Yeah, completely different, completely different mm -hmm. language. So. Right. Uh, that's that. I think that's why Chinese medicine has uh, it's still so strong because they're treating elements of nature actually. So I treat wind, I treat cold, I treat heat, I treat damp, I te treat dryness, and these manifest in the body in completely different ways. So it's the idea that what happens in the exterior also happens in the interior of the body. So where we have dry in the, in the elements, we also have dry within us. And that might be dry skin, it might be constipation, it might be dry eyes, it might be any kind of dryness we see. We have heat, which can be uh, hot flashes, or it could be sweating, or it could be any type of heat sensation in the body. So these are the things you're actually treating in the body. We're regulating pretty much the, the weather of the body, right? And... Uh... When you get to something like a, a very specific disease, um, and let's just say um, high blood pressure, mm. or what we'll get into cancer, but let's leave cancer to the side for a little bit. And, and uh, let's say somebody has what we would call chronic obstructive lung disease, you mm -hmm. know, has a history of smoking, no longer smokes, but has a lot of lung damage and has. Uh, shortness of breath and cough. And in the Western world, we'd do a chest X-ray and we'd see the, the blebs and bullae in the lung and with the history and the symptoms, we would call it um, a COPD, chronic mm -hmm. obstructive pulmonary disease. What would be a similar, uh, what would be the analogy or how what, what sort of terms would you use mm -hmm. to describe that patient? And then how would you try to get the weather and alignment, <laughs> uh, the internal weather to right. help manage their symptoms? Yeah. If, so, if not cure the disease. Right. Yeah, you see, there's, so in China, uh, you know, I work as a general practitioner. So I see all different types of patients come in. I see a lot of COPD patients come in. Uh, in China, it's something they treat quite frequently because they, with the pollution and the smoking over there is, is pretty severe. So you have doctors that would just specialize over there in pulmonary disorders, or you have doctors that just special in cardio disorders. Um, and what you see is we treat things like excess phlegm, blood stagnation, qi stagnation, and you talk about the word qi. Uh, we see um, excess and deficiency, right? Is that the lungs in excess or are the lungs deficient in something? Uh, and then we can also see dryness in there, right? So this would be if the patient comes in, one of the important things is that they always come in with a Western diagnosis like this. And we need, to, we need to translate that into a Chinese medicine diagnosis because that's what I practice, right? I don't, typically, I'm, I'm not necessarily treating COPD. I'm treating the patient, mm -hmm. right? And so 
when they come in, how are they manifesting? I might have five different patients with the same Western diagnosis, but I give five different treatments to them because they all manifest it differently, right? So most often you're going to see uh, obstruction of the chest with phlegm, mucus. Um, it may be blood streaks, so there might be blood stagnation. They might have wheezing. They might have uh, weak lungs, so we can, we can strengthen the lungs. We can move the blood. Um, and there's herbs we can use for that. There's foods we can use for that. Acupuncture we can use for that. Uh, tai Chi, Qigong. Qigong is a, um, a way that we use the lungs. The lungs are considered the sea of Qi, right? So in Chinese medicine, they have all these classic sayings. They're called statements of fact. So it's the lungs. Qi, we might as well just talk about the word Qi. So there's a lot of words we don't translate because they don't have an English translation. So we use the Chinese word. Uh, qi, which we've all kind of heard of, maybe loosely translated as energy, mm -hmm. right? But really, uh, it goes way deeper than that. And it's very cultural understanding. When you talk to a Chinese person, they understand qi instantly, what you mean. Not only, if we look at the Chinese character, the top half of the character means a gaseous element, like oxygen. The bottom half of the character means grain of rice. So it gives us this idea that the air we breathe and the food we eat gives us life force. It gives us qi. Everything in our world has chi, right? Everything has a life force to it. It's alive. Um, so we build that chi through what we eat and the air we breathe. So, and that governs the body and the lungs control that. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're you're trying to get restore balance, mm -hmm. uh, and. You're trying to uh, improve kind of well-being. You're not so much focused on, um, so in the Western world, we don't believe there's a cure for COPD, right. that there's management of the disease. Um, other diseases, and we can talk about cancer, we think that there are ways of curing certain cancers, meaning eradicating it. Mm -hmm. uh, but some chronic conditions like COPD, we think that after 50 years of smoking and lung damage, that that we just don't believe there's a way of reversing all of that and curing mm -hmm. it. So it's a matter of how do we manage right. and improve quality of life and well-being yeah, exactly. and healing, even though it's not going to be curing the disease. Yeah. So what would be some of the um, Chinese medicine techniques you would use to treat? And, and you've already told me that not every patient with COPD is the same. Mm -hmm. The treatments might, might not be the same. But maybe give me a, a, a characteristic, a, a, a classic patient, yeah. a common type of patient that you would see and how you would then formulate a, a course of treatment. Okay. Yeah. So we also look the same way, uh, you know, the prognosis of a, of a, of a disease may be, may be curable, may not be curable. You may just be giving some kind of uh, palliative care to it, um, improving quality of life, right? If we can improve 50%, that's 50%. If we can improve 20%, that's an improvement as well. Um, so we look at how, how can we treat this patient? If this patient comes in, then we start maybe with a diet, right? What is the person eating? are we we don't want to cause more obstruction so we don't want foods that are inflammatory in the body we don't want foods that are going to cause more mucus in the body right so things we look at the food therapy in chinese medicine is probably food and herbs are probably the beginning the foundation of it and that goes back five thousand six thousand years so we're looking at what do foods do in the body to us not necessarily the chemical makeup of the food but how does it how does it happen in the body what does it do to it does it dry it out does it moisten it does it heat it up does it cool it uh, does it give it energy does it slow it down so we say that uh, we look at the five flavors of the of the food right uh, sour salty spicy bitter pungent and we try to balance these so if one patient is having too much mucus too much phlegm then foods that are sweet slow down digestion so we don't want to use those types of foods so we might look at their diet and say how can we adjust your diet to be um, more uh, less phlegm producing right and we can also look at herbs well what kind of herbs um, promote blood circulation what, what herbs uh, promote oxygen benefit the lungs so ginseng we're lucky now because in china they do lots of research at the universities on the herbs there 
you know, they have thousands upon thousands of items in the Materia Medica. And doctors for thousands of years have written formulations for all these patterns, right? So obstruction of the lungs with phlegm is a, is a well-written uh, pattern, right? So you might look at what herbs can I use for this patient? Right? And then what acupuncture treatments can I use? What exercise program can, I, can we do? What kind of breathing exercises can they do? Um, something like that. And then you, you start to formulate your, your treatment principles, right? And your, your protocol. So something chronic like this, you're just looking for maybe get some relief, some improvement, and then you can gauge it as you go, right? How you're going to follow up. And if we turn to acupuncture specifically, so I think if you just mentioned Chinese medicine to the lay public, most people think of acupuncture as uh -huh. kind of uh, a characteristic response. And uh, what is the theory behind how the needles affect the body <laughs> and provide relief of symptoms or treatment of mm. diseases? So, um, you know, when we do a surgery, we kind of have this idea of what you're doing, whether you're doing uh, releasing a nerve that's entrapped or you're mm -hmm. removing a tumor or you're, um, you know, uh, 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 taking out a gallbladder. Those are pretty straightforward mm -hmm. types of this is what that procedure is doing. Right. Um, what's the general theory behind where you put the needles and how the needle interacting with the body mm -hmm. results in a change yeah this is this is a question everyone how does it work <laughs> you know it's when you get all the time and that's a it's a difficult question to ask because uh to understand because you have to understand the foundation of why how how would it be perceived a thousand years ago hmm. right a thousand years ago it was still three thousand years into the medicine so the idea of why they use it and what it does to the body may be understood in different ways, right? So if we look at uh, fMRI scans of when we do acupuncture in the brain and what's going on, now Western science is, is great at telling us what's going on internally and we can see deeper, oh, this is why it works or this is why it works, we're activating this, right? Which is uh, incredibly amazing information. But if we look at what, how do we practice, that's not really how we practice. Um, and it, it may have some overlap now, right? Eastern and Western are definitely overlapping. And China is right in the forefront of that because this medicine uh, is completely integrated over there. You know, they've had an easy time integrating it. So they have the Eastern and Western approach. When we, when we formulate a, an acupuncture uh, formulation of points, we're looking at what organ systems are we working on, right? So each acupuncture channel that goes through the body has different points on and they all go back to different organ systems. The simple answer is the body naturally heals itself, right? So just if you were to scratch your finger or cut your finger, your body automatically starts healing. So if I put a foreign object into your body, it's going to see it as an invader and it's going to try to heal it, right? It heals the injury site. So if you, we look at it real simply, we're just creating uh, minute injuries to the body and uh, making the body heal it, right? And we can, we can manipulate that process, right? So to understand how that works, there's a classic saying in Chinese medicine that says, if you have a headache, treat your feet, right? And we're in Western medicine, if you have a headache, everyone comes in, they're like, oh, my pain's here, and I put the needles on their feet, and then many of them are like, I, did you hear me? It's up here. <laughs> so understanding the, the environment within the body, we're creating harmony, right? If there's too much going on in the head already and I put needles up there, it's going to make it worse. But if I, if I put needles in the feet, then I, I attract that healing energy that the body naturally has away from the head. The body's trying to treat something up here, right? And it could be causing that, that pain. If I put it in the feet, it pulls that away and lets that relax. You know, we know, we know that the body can only treat the most acute thing that's happening. And a needle stuck in your foot is the most acute thing that's happening. So it shuts those other pain symptoms off, right? But how do I treat fertility and migraines in the same way? How do I treat dermato dermatological disorders in the same way? I'm treating eczema the same way I'm treating a migraine, right? Because I'm treating the underlying pattern of it, right? So I think that's, that's the genius part of it, that I'm not just treating the headache, I'm treating the whole patient. Yeah. Um, let's go to cancer. 
Hmm. Um, are there, uh, is there any thought that um, Chinese medicine cures certain types of cancer? Oh, cures a, a tricky word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can you can say uh, remission, right? Because if I um, if I it's like, it's like this: you have a garden, right? And you go out and pull all your weeds, and say my garden's cured of weeds. I don't need to come back for the rest of the summer, mm -hmm. right? All those weeds are going to come right back if you don't change the reason it's happening mm -hmm. in the first place. If you don't get to the root cause of it, it's not going to stay away, right? So I think looking at what is the root cause of it? How is it? Why is it manifesting in that person? And how is it? How is it manifesting? So you don't say that you cure it. We don't even say that we treat cancer, right? Technically, legally, you can't. Technically, I. In China, they may say that, right? They may say mm -hmm. that you know, with herbs, acupuncture, they might treat cancer, but it's more you're treating the patient. Yeah, yeah. and that's kind of what my thought is so when i send a patient for uh, to explore acupuncture as a remedy it, i'm using it i'm thinking of it as a healing process not so much to kill the cancer cells but to help manage symptoms mm -hmm. that might be symptoms from the cancer or probably more commonly there's there's symptoms or side effects from the cancer treatment yeah and let's say peripheral neuropathy mm -hmm. or um some sort of uh stiffness and limitation of movement based because of scarring from either mm -hmm. surgery or radiation so that's I'm, I'm usually when i say let's try getting you to see an acupuncture it's just more symptom management than treating the cancer i think i think understanding the role at this point that chinese medicine has uh in connection with western medicine right as a as a complementary medicine i mm -hmm. think that's the best term to use because western medicine is a it's a physical medicine it's very mechanistic right and it's very good at eradicating major things from the body it's very fast and it's emergency medicine right where Chinese medicine, it's, it's about harmonizing the body and, and treating the body, right? So it's um, more for balancing that out. And it's a wider perspective of the body. It's not looking at the, the detailed cellular activity so much. It's looking at how is the body performing on a whole. And in that, they're really good at making the body stronger, right? Western medicine, the treatments can be very uh, draining to the mm -hmm. body, right? And you will have lots of side effects because you're treating aggressively quickly, mm -hmm. right? And in many cancer cases, uh, cases you have to, but that creates side effects, right? I'm glad that you started off talking really about the philosophical and how the philosophy of China is part and parcel of this balance when you think of the yin and the yang and the, you know, and the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, using force against itself and you know getting out of the way and and the way that uh the chinese philosophical concept of, of balance is so important um you shared with me before we started the interview that as part of your training or right after training you spent a year with a practitioner of chinese medicine mm -hmm. that was uh taking care of cancer patients mm -hmm. maybe uh talk a little bit about that year and then we'll get into where do you see uh the role of chinese medicine in cancer care either as part of the treatment as patients are going through western treatment of cancer or in helping to provide healing and symptom relief maybe after cancer treatment mm -hmm. yeah i was i was like you said I, I was really lucky to have the opportunity to be uh, granted an internship with a, a senior practitioner in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. She had, uh, her name was Beverly Burns, and she had started two clinics that were free clinics for women of poverty with cancer. So all the treatments were free, all the acupuncture, the herbs, the counseling, everything was uh, free. So I got to do, I got to put the herbs together. I got to be around and do some of the moxibustion treatments and got to trail her as she saw patients. So. Uh, you know, maybe the course of a year I was there and uh, it was really an amazing experience to see 
how you're not, you're, you're looking at the patient's whole life, right? How can we assist the patient in their whole life? Like I said, Chinese medicine is not necessarily uh, you take a, a pill and then you don't have responsibility, right? You don't go get your acupuncture and then go home and do whatever you want. Your practitioner has to guide you into how is a, a more balanced life going to help your current situation? What does a balanced life look for this patient? What does their food look like? Where's their mind at? Where's the emotional state of the patient? Where's the physical state of the patient? How can, how can we work that within modern society and the stresses of modern society? It's very challenging. Yes, and the yeah. social determinants of health and exactly, and uh, you know. So when when we look at how does Chinese medicine play, you know, it was a lot easier a thousand years ago because there was no electricity, there was no distractions, everybody kind of ate the same food, right? It was all in a smaller village. So now we have we're a, a society of excess, you know. So we have everything available to us, we're, and the disease patterns that we see within Chinese medicine are more of excess conditions now, right? The body's kind of uh, has too much going on. So understanding the role of Chinese medicine today with, with the cancer, modern cancer patient is, you know, we see a lot of uh, things like uh, anemia or nausea, vomiting, pain, low blood counts, right? So these, they've been long uh, research in Chinese medicine. So using foods and herbs to, to, to treat these symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. And many of the conditions you just mentioned may all be manifestations of the treatment they received. Right. Not, not manifestations of the actual disease. Right. You know, it was, uh, 2,500 years ago, they were already writing about breast cancer. You know, they were, they called them breast stones. Right. And they had treatment methods for those topical treatments, internal treatments, food treatments, acupuncture. So they have a long history of uh, treating in that way. When you combine it with Western medicine, it can be extremely powerful. Right? And, and what I see with a lot of patients is uh, maybe they're so exhausted from their chemotherapy treatments, they can't even continue treatments. You know, Chinese medicine has a really amazing ability to build that, what we call the zheng qi. Zheng qi is like your upright immune system right it's it's the force that fights off uh fights off disease right we call it our immune system so they spent so much time and energy on building that that that's really supports the modern cancer patient right can really build their blood cells back up can build their immune system back up build their digestion up and so we see through digestion and the air we breathe if we can build those up they get stronger and they get stronger and their body's able to fight that off um, let's get real specific. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about two different entities and let's say someone comes into your office and, um, doesn't really understand the whole Chinese philosophy and the balance. And they come in because they've got a particular symptom that they want you to address. That's most of them. <laughs> uh -huh. So, um, let, we're, we're going to talk about two. One would be, um, lymphedema of the arm on the side that a, a woman had breast surgery and radiation. Mm -hmm. And another would be, um, a gentleman who went through lung cancer treatment and has peripheral neuropathy of the hands and the feet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so you know, the first patient, we, it, we don't needle, uh, the side that the lymph nodes are removed. Right. So one thing about Chinese medicine is we have, uh, local points and distal points. Mm -hmm. Right. So let me just ask. So is that in deference to the Westerners who would say, don't mess with this arm. A little bit of both. Or yeah, a little bit of both. Like in a thousand years ago, if you didn't have a Western doctor saying, don't stick a needle in this <laughs> arm, you might have stuck a needle in that arm. I mean, well, I'm not saying that that would be a wrong thing to do, but probably many people. In well, they wouldn't have been taking lymph nodes out, you know, back then. So you wouldn't have had the, the issue. Right. Um, but there are, there are things you don't want to needle. Hmm. So when a condition is more acute, or in, a, in a, a condition is more replete, we might say, uh, you, the further away the needles are going to be. So let's say there's uh, an inflammatory response going on in that area. So mm -hmm. we put needles in there, we're going to cause more problems. Sure. But we're saying it's five years after the surgery and it's yeah. a chronic. Chronic condition. Uh, so what we do is we work through the organ systems, right? So what, what organs are responsible for fluid metabolizing? 
right? What, what, what organs are responsible for moving the fluids through the body? So we have the lungs, we have the spleen and the kidneys. So it's important to understand when we talk about organs, we're not talking about biomedical organs per se. We're talking about the physiological system within Chinese medicine. What is that kidney system responsible for it and the totality of it, right? So it's responsible for growth, reproduction, aging, hormones, hearing, uh, head hair, all these things, right? So when we talk about the organ system, everything that it encompasses, we're working on. And it, it treats the bones as well. The kidneys are responsible for the bones in Chinese medicine. The spleen is responsible for uh, the transformation of the fluids, right? So our digestive properties. So if we would transform the fluids better, then the lymphedema won't be as severe. So when we, when we needle the body, we're l working on those, not necessarily the, the arm itself, right? We're working on the whole body to transform it, you know, because it's an enclosed system, you know? Does that answer that? <laughs> yes. Um, and then how about peripheral neuropathy? Yeah, peripheral neuropathy. So I see a fair amount of that, you know, both uh, for many different reasons. Are you going to have diabetic peripheral yeah, neuropathy? Yeah, we see, we see. You can have just basically diabetic yeah, neuropathy. Yeah. And... yeah, we see quite a bit of it actually. So acupuncture does really well with neuropathy because it stimulates the nerves, right? So they know now uh, how that how that happens with acupuncture we can we can put the needles along the channel you know along the spine where the nerves come out we can we view the body many different ways we we view it as maybe musculoskeletal or we might view it as organs or we might view it as fluid pathology right so we look we diagnose on different levels neuropathy we may just take it more from a physical standpoint just run the channel with the needles down and stimulate all the way down. Uh, we might have to see if there's underlying constitutional deficiencies or excesses that are leading to it, like in uh, diabetes, right? Or does the patient have those uh, underlying deficiencies or excesses before they went into their chemotherapy treatments? Or has the chemotherapy now caused some of those uh, constitutional imbalances that we need to address to help uh, nourish the nerves better, right? So everything's nourished through the blood in Chinese medicine. So creating that circulation uh, and that strength through the blood, right? To nourish the nurse, to help them heal. And um, what other conditions have you um, treated successfully in patients who also have a cancer diagnosis? So I'm saying they may be in the midst of cancer treatment or they may be cancer survivors that you know, are cancer free? Mm -hmm. What are some of the conditions that you think you have a really high level mm -hmm. of success? The, well, I think there's, there's a lot going on in, in the, the broad picture of, of the cancer patient, both emotionally and physically. I think one of the things that Chinese medicine is excellent. And philosophically. And, and philosophically. You're looking at, at life. And uh, I think one of the things that Chinese medicine is really good at is uh, regulating the emotional state, the psychological state of what's going on. Because we know that acupuncture helps uh, release endorphins, it helps relax the mind, uh, relax, creates a, a relaxed state of the body temporarily, right? And if we do that over and over and over, then the patient maybe starts to sleep better. They get better sleep, then they feel better through the day, and then the body gets stronger. So I think... Uh, not only in the physical realm, but also in the psychological realm. Chinese medicine is very successful at, you know, you'll see um, patients with pain, like from surgical sites, right? Um, we'll treat a lot of that. We'll treat a lot of internal organ problems, you know, very successfully with nausea, vomiting, lack of appetite, you know, stuff like that. Um, a, a wide variety of things. It, and it's also getting the patient to understand what, what, we think of healthy in the East might not be thought of in the West or what we think of healthy in the West might not be in the East, right? So a patient might say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing smoothies every day. I'm being healthy, right? I'm doing smoothies and salads and uh, I'm getting in all my, all my fruits and vegetables, right? So Chinese medicine, that would be, that'd be the wrong diet, right? It's too cold. You're eating too many cold foods, You're eating food combinations we don't normally eat by juicing or by creating smoothies, we're eating out of season. If it's wintertime and we're eating salads, it's out of season. You want to eat locally. So if you're eating tropical fruit in Iowa in the wintertime, that's not what your body needs. You are a product of your environment, right? So to, 
to nourish the body where it exists, right? So you want to, there's, a, there's an interesting field within Chinese medicine that's extremely deep that all the master doctors have written books about called uh, health cultivation, right? This is called Yangsheng. Yangsheng is a whole study within the medicine of how do I live in harmony with nature through the seasons? What do I eat? How do I think? How do I approach my uh, community? How do I approach my myself? Um, and these will change throughout your life, throughout your phases of, mm -hmm. of your uh, cycles, right? Of, and then through the year, it'll change. And then where you live, it'll change. So these are the guiding points that really help a patient become more balanced within that lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I could see um, a little bit of an issue. Somebody comes in and says, you know, I get the swelling in my arm and, and um, they don't know they're walking into like a life coach who wants to help find uh, harmony and balance <laughs> if they just want you to fix their arm. Oh yeah, that's all they want. <laughs> so how many come back a second time uh, uh, when, when after uh, the first hour you haven't fixed their arm? Yeah, you can't you can't throw the whole medicine at them. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. So so how do you you know Jay? Yeah. approach a patient yeah. who doesn't have an understanding of Chinese philosophy and this balance and they have a symptom that they are coming to you yeah. for help. Yeah, in the beginning, you know, when you're a young practitioner, you want to fix everything. You're like, oh, I see all the great things that could happen in you. And, and you try to do too much, right? And then when you start, you start to back it off, you learn, well, okay, they just probably need to fix this. And then you just start planting seeds. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to work on this. You don't put too much on You need to it. develop the relationship Yeah. first. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Um, one of the greatest quotes that I love is from a, a Chinese practitioner, um, Li Dongyuan. He says that, you know, a Chinese medicine doctor should approach every patient as if they were a family member, right? And every patient should see their doctor as a, as a member of their family because you're, you need to understand them. You need to understand what, what are they doing during the day? How are they acting? Why are they do, doing this, right? Most people, their diet, they're uh, emotionally attached to, right? They're, they're, um, their whole life might be built into it, you know, through uh, family, right? And they, they might be eating for emotional reasons. They might be medicating. We're all medicating. And then, of course, there's just the habit of what you are Right. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. how, how do you go about changing that, right? The patient might be might benefit greatly by taking dairy out of their diet, might, might improve their condition greatly, but that's an emotional attachment. You can't force them to, right? You can suggest it and explain to them, this might benefit you, and then eat them into it. So, you know, Western uh, medicine, uh, William Osler, um, uh, uh, quotation, you know, good doctor treats the disease, a great doctor teaches treats the patient mm. so a similar concept of uh whether it's eastern or western that there's this this whole person not just but i, but I agree that western tends to what's the problem let's deal with that problem and doesn't he often right. get into uh, and more holistic. You mentioned the word complementary. I totally agree that uh, Chinese can be complementary to Western. We're tending to use the word now integrative, just mm -hmm. meaning the same thing. So uh, with the expansion of our cancer center, I'm bringing integrative medicine into the cancer mm -hmm. center. Right. So looking at bringing in all of these uh, other forms of healing that, you know, my western trained way maybe thinking well I'm, I'm not bringing these into the clinic because i think they're going to help us kill more cancer cells mm. but that as because i'm very interested in the whole patient right. mind body spirit that i'm thinking these other uh practices may help achieve that healing right. and wellness and improvement in quality of life, even if they don't, you know, improve the cure rate of cancer. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, th I think in that you're going to be much more successful, right, seeing the bigger picture of it. And that's why I say they work so well together, because Western medicine takes that small approach and we take the wider approach. So uh, tell me about some patients that you feel you have uh, changed their lives um helped improve 
hmm. healing and quality, whether it's a cancer patient or not. But maybe it's just some examples yeah. where you had a dramatic impact on the lives of patients. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> just you choose know. one patient. Well, you know, I think the fun, the 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 fun part is of it is that you're there because you care, right? Because your heart's in it. Or you don't you don't follow Chinese medicine because it's a, you know, something you you picked up at school. You follow it because you're passionate about it. And most people that go into this field are extremely passionate and caring. Uh, and it's interesting because Chinese medicine. There's a to follow up on your quote. There's a quote that says the. Uh, Average doctor treats disease before it happens, or treats disease after it happens, where the superior doctor treats disease before it mm. happens. And Chinese medicine has been saying that for a long time. So you see, yeah. you know, that they're, um, they're there to, how do I want to say it? When you want to use that actually first, right? You want to, you want to treat, you want to live your lifestyle in such a way that you're preventing the disease. So when a patient comes into me in the West though, They've been through every Western testing. Mm -hmm. They've gone through all their labs. A lot of the times they can't figure out what's wrong with them, right? And, they, and they're just at their wits ends. Or they don't like their options at that point, right? Um, and Chinese medicine usually has an explanation for it and can, can often be very successful. And when you see p patients change, they're like, I thought I was going to be stuck with this for the rest of my life. Or I've had this condition for 20 years. And you changed it within six months. And now I don't have it anymore. That's you see them light up, like they have a whole new life. It's amazing, right? And like I said, I see all different types of disorders. So skin disorders that people have had for 20, 30 years, and they come in, and with a few months, it's completely gone. Or fertility patients, cancer patients, right? Pain patients. They all, I've had people come in with migraines that they've had every day for years, and you put one needle in, and it goes away. And they just, they just, they don't, they're, they don't know what you did. <laughs> They're amazed, right? And you're kind of amazed. Mm -hmm. and you're like, wow, this stuff works. <laughs> and it's, it's just a really cool feeling. It's, it's, it's really amazing, you know, to be part of that. So, so you mentioned uh, fertility, you mentioned headaches. Uh, in terms of uh, cancer uh, um, patients, either symptoms from their cancer or um, symptoms they're having as a result of cancer treatment. What are some other examples of cancer patients that you have treated where you, mm -hmm. you feel like you improved their healing and their quality of life? I would say I'd say the most common thing that I see uh, for patients like that is their, their digestion improves, that their uh, strength improves, right? And that their peace of mind improves, right? These, it, it, usually when they come in, they have that... Um, uh, fearful, scared, worried look, and it takes a few treatments. And before you know it, they're coming in smiling and they feel relaxed. And when they leave, they, their body's completely changed, right? We always say that they're walking out with ac acupuncture brain because they are in this different state. And that, and it really helps them to find that balance and, and, in their life again, you know. So I'm going to ask you a question that probably comes from a Western perspective. So the question maybe isn't even fair in the Eastern perspective, but, um, so there are practitioners of acupuncture who don't have considerable knowledge of herbs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can go to an acupuncture right. training. To what extent do you think acupuncture versus diet, what you're eating for your nutrition versus um, herbs as supplement or medicine and that may be not the right way of thinking mm -hmm. of it but is it is it all of that for everybody and that we mm -hmm. probably all should be doing that is mm -hmm. just like we brush our teeth every day <laughs> we don't wait till we have cavities to right. do it yeah. I, I, I understand that some of what it, we call chinese medicine is really just a way of life that helps prevent disease right but um would you yeah, so the idea is that uh, it is, it's very complex, right? You're right. Um, to get in the state of Iowa to be a licensed acupuncturist, you don't have to study herbs. And it's not necessary for your boards or your exams or anything like that. Um, my school was heavily steeped in herbs, and it was one of my passions. We're the only clinic in Iowa that carries a full raw herb pharmacy plus pills and powders. So I see a lot of patients coming from all over the state who have knowledge of herbs, I think Chicago's where most of them go after us. 
it's a very complex way of practicing, you know, thousands of herbs that are uh, used by diagnosis and then formulated together and then modified, right? Um, not an easy thing to do. So some practitioners don't even get into it. You know, it's much easier for them to do acupuncture and food therapy. You want to, you don't want to take herbs the rest of your life. In Western medicine, you might have to take a pharmaceutical to keep you alive for the rest of your life, right? Uh, herbs aren't that way. Food's not that way. You want to treat the condition as it's happening, right? And once the condition is resolved, then you can stop the treatment, right? So you wouldn't want to be on herbal formulations for the rest of your life. You want to use food first, right? That should be your main medicine. The second, then if food doesn't work, uh, then use the herbs. And that comes from John Zhong Jing a couple thousand years ago. First use that first use the food that doesn't work use the herbs right so if i give a patient all these great herbs that i spend hours coming up with and it's just genius and i give it to them and they go home and eat ice cream and pizza it's it's not going to do anything <laughs> or it's going to slow it down right so understanding we don't we don't all we can all gain from that knowledge right we can all gain a few things here and there well maybe i shouldn't eat um, cold stuff in the winter time, or maybe you shouldn't eat salads. You know, it just helps your life out a little bit better. There's so such deep wisdom there. How do we translate a lot of that cultural stuff into our culture, mm -hmm. right? To help us benefit and stay healthy and prevent disease. I think that's the that's the difficult part of it because it's language based, it's cultural based, it's food driven, right? So that's the trick of it. So I'm lucky that I live here, that I grew up here. So I understand the culture. Yes. Right. So how can I translate that? A lot of my job is how do I translate Chinese medicine into the culture here? Yeah. We're going to uh, go to our live studio audience here and see if we have some questions. So, yeah. So let's talk about the business model of mm. acupuncture and uh, Chinese medicine. So, okay. you know, in the Western world, I click a box for the CPT code of what I did and somebody sends a bill off to the insurance company and the insurance company reimburses. How, mm -hmm. does, how does it work in your yeah. clinic? It's getting there. It's really close to that now. So, uh, so a lot more insurance companies do cover acupuncture. It depends on uh, the plan that you have. You know, I know there's um, some corporations in town that provide it for their, I know Wells Fargo is good at it. Um, we don't, currently billed directly, so patients will pay at the time, and then we'll give them their uh, their billing codes and the super bills, and they get reimbursed. Um, some of it we are set up to start billing uh, next year or sooner. Medicare just announced last year that they're going to cover acupuncture for low back pain, so that's the first uh, thing that they've said they're going to cover acupuncture for. So there's a whole process of who they're going to cover, the practitioners, and but that's underway, which is really important. So mm -hmm. yeah. you're getting there. But right now, you would say that uh, someone who comes to you will pay out of pocket, and that then they would seek reimbursement, and they may or may not be successful depending Correct. which yeah. insurance company they have and who their employer is. And so, Correct. so, um, th and that has to be a barrier to people seeking you for the patient. It can be it can be a little taxing um, because it's. It might not be affordable for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my clinic, by not taking insurance currently, I'm not controlled by uh, the contracts or they don't get to dictate my fees and stuff. So I will often do uh, packages or say give discounts to people because they might not be able to afford it. It's more important that they get treated, mm -hmm. right? So we want to make it sure what's going to work for them. How are they going to get treatment, right? And we've done we've done uh, community acupuncture uh, clinics over the past years where people will come in and do twenty five dollar acupuncture. And they're all in a larger room together, you know. So we, we try to make it affordable for the community. So, okay. yeah. Other questions? Um, you mentioned like a, a local. Uh, same with acupuncture here. You mentioned like a local acupuncture versus uh, non local, mm -hmm. and you, you gave a good under, understanding of what non local is. Uh -huh. but Give me a, an example of like a local acupuncture that you would do. Yeah. So this is interesting. This is something that we've been kind of dealing with our profession. Uh, when I was in school, you know, 20 years ago, uh, physical therapists are doing dry needling, right? And so what dry needling is, 
is you take the acupuncture needle and you in, um, insert into an active trigger point. Now, all trigger points are acupuncture points, but not all uh, acupuncture points are trigger points, right? So what it is, is this is a nodule in the muscle band that we can go through and manually stimulate till it releases uh, and then opens it up, right? So that, that technique has been around for 2,500 years that they've been writing about it. So what happened, you know, over the past 20 years is they they renamed acupuncture dry needling so they don't have to go through all the schooling but it's just one technique so that would be a local technique where i'm going in and i'm treating manually treating a muscle in that area right so treating where it hurts where it hurts yeah. yeah yeah releasing that muscle might get quick relief right so that would be a local site okay other questions yes uh, I would say so. I think, um, like we said, we want to prevent disease before it happens. There's an old Chinese saying, don't start to dig a well when you're thirsty, right? Don't sharpen your tools when the war has already begun, right? All these old Chinese sayings, we want to prevent disease before it happens. There's, they say that a Chinese medicine doctor will, will save your life, but they'll do it 30 years in advance, right? Because if they see you going down this path, this, we, we understand that the body's naturally going to have these problems, right? If we can get you back on that centered path, then you're going to be able to alleviate a lot more problems. Mm -hmm. So understanding the patient, like you said, you have to understand the patient and their tendencies and where they're going and then where do they need to be. Yeah. And find the middle way. And find the middle way. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jay, this has been great. Thank you for uh, talking to us about uh, acupuncture and Chinese medicine in general. Thank you. So this has been, I've learned a lot tonight. Yeah, thank you. So thanks, everybody, for attending the uh, Cancer Education Series sponsored by Mercy Cancer Center and uh, Above and Beyond Cancer. Uh, please come back and join us next week. If you would like to see this program again or if you have friends or family members you would like to share this with, it will be this video podcast will be on the Mercy One Cancer Center website, and it will also be on the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel so you can watch it again. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.